to cut my beba, water but so much better. Had to work my beba, water but so much better. Beba, sparkling flavored water, water but better. For the everyday lowest prices on all grocery items, trust Low Cost Supermarket for the widest variety of quality products at low prices. Freshly picked fruits and vegetables, healthy products for your well-being, high quality meat cuts, and a warm and friendly service. Low Cost Supermarket, Southern Main Road, Kunupia. Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys and welcome to Sea Results. I'm Miss Nyla and we are going to be starting ELA today on our Tuesday segment, right, of Sea Results. Uh, so yesterday, a uh, lot of you, you know, who were locked on with us, you know, we were on the topic of pronouns and we are going to continue today with pronouns. So we are almost through uh, with the seven different types of pronouns. Um, we're just going to do a quick recap before we move forward. Right, um, just to remind you guys um, what is a pronoun and the types of pronouns that we are looking at. Right, we know that a pronoun is a word used to replace a noun. But what, is, what are we focusing on is really the seven different types of pronouns and the use of function of each type of pronoun. So we looked at quite a few yesterday and here's a list of the, you know, the ones that we are focusing on. So we looked at personal already, which included subject and object pronouns, reflexive pronouns. We looked at demonstrative. Um, we still have to look at indefinite, possessive, interrogative. We are currently on this and relative pronouns, right? So interrogative pronouns. Um, we did start interrogative pronouns yesterday, but I'm just going to go back from the beginning with this as um, it also has interrogative adjectives here and just for the benefit of our new viewers or viewers you know who weren't able to join us yesterday they will understand as well right so let's look on here so interrogative pronouns right these pronouns are used to begin a question so it's just like um the five w's and h except we have a few extra so we have like who whom which what whoever whomever whichever and whatever all of these are interrogative pronouns and as you can tell by now they ask a question or they are used to begin a question for example very simply which is yours or what is inside the box or to whom am i speaking all of these are interrogative right they are questions using the pronouns um, that we have just listed so that's simple for you to remember Here's a tricky part, right? Um, we have to know the difference between an interrogative pronoun and an interrogative adjective. So when we use the pronoun he, whose, what and which, right? When they are followed by nouns, they are called interrogative adjectives. So again, when we have whose, what and which, when followed by nouns, they are interrogative 
adjectives. They are known as interrogative adjectives. Now, it's just three out of the list that we just gave here. So it's not much for you to remember, right? And we are going to look at some sentences and examples to help us identify interrogative pronouns and interrogative adjectives. You just simply have to remember, um, just like we did demonstrative pronouns and demonstrative adjectives, where it proceeds with a noun, it's similar here. Interrogative adjectives, um, when followed by a noun, it becomes an interrogative adjective. And if it does not um, follow, if the pronoun is not followed by a noun, um, the pronoun that we just listed, that is, we know it's an interrogative pronoun. So let's look at these sentences here. Which dress belongs to you? So in example one, we have two sentences. Which dress belongs to you and which belongs to you? So can you identify which is an interrogative adjective and which is an interrogative pronoun? First, you must be able to identify, identify the, um, the pronoun. So we have which, right, in both of these sentences. So we have already identified that. Which, let's take it sentence by sentence. Now, which dress? So you would notice here that the word dress is actually a noun. So if a noun follows the interrogative pronoun, it is therefore an interrogative adjective. It becomes an interrogative adjective. But if you look at the se second example, which belongs to you, we have your interrogative pronoun here, but belongs is not a noun. So therefore, this is an interrogative pronoun. Right, so note the difference there. Let's look at example number two. Whose boots are these and whose are these? Again, we have to identify the interrogative pronoun and then what follows that pronoun is what is important and it's going to help us to determine whether it's an interrogative pronoun or interrogative adjective. So we have the word boots here and boots, that part, that part of speech is actually a noun. So this is an interrogative adjective again and then we have whose are these? Who's followed by a helping verb, which makes it an interrogative pronoun. So it's very simple. You just have to follow out here to the rule. Right? So we have a couple sentences here. We're going to open up the lines and we're going to ask callers, you know, to tell us whether it's an interrogative pronoun or interrogative adjective. Remember, um, interrogative adjectives, we're only looking for a couple interrogative pronouns or pronouns here like who is what and which so this is a hint you can look out for who who's what or which to help you identify and we have a call on the line I'm going to take this call good evening caller welcome to see results hi good evening welcome to see results hi good day. hi what's your name Nima friendly okay nice to have you with us so we're looking at number one here who told him to open the door um, is this an interrogative adjective or is this interrogative pronoun? Interrogative adjective. Okay, so first of all, point out the pronoun for me here. Um, told and door. N well, told there will be a verb and door will be a noun. How do we know um, what is a pronoun here? What are the pronouns we are looking at? What type of pronouns are we looking at right now? Adjective and I forget the other one. Okay, listen to the question. What type of pronouns are we looking at? We are, are we looking at demonstrative pronouns, subject pronouns, or interrogative pronouns? Interrogative. So interrogative pronouns ask a question. That's how we know it's interrogative. Right, so the interrogative pronoun in this sentence will be which word? Um, who? Who, right? So that is your in, that's your pronoun. So, oh, right. So it will be who, who? and I will be asking who do that. Right, but listen to the question. Right, I want to find out whether it's an interrogative pronoun or an interrogative adjective, and the only way I would know that is if. Um, the interrogative, or sorry, not the interrogative, the pronoun here is followed yeah. by a noun. So the word next to it or right after it must be a noun. Is the word right after who a noun? No. Right. What part of speech is the word told? It's a verb. A verb, right? So this is a verb. So what type of um, question is this? Interrogative pronoun or interrogative adjective? 
interrogative adjective. Right. Do you understand what we did just now? Yeah. Okay, great job it there. Was, it was so exciting. <laughs> All right, no problem with that. Thank you so much for calling. Right, so great job there, caller. Right, so let's try not to get it mixed up. Remember, just as I told the caller, we have to identify the pronoun and we have to identify the word next to it, whether it's a noun or not. We have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to Sea Results. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening. What's your name? Kaylee Spencer. Hi, Kaylee. So we're on to number two. What is the answer for number two? Interrogative adjective. Right. And how do you know that? Because plant is unknown. You are correct. And I just made a mistake here, and probably some of you noticed that. I meant to say interrogative pronoun here. And number two is correct. So thank you so much for calling. So I just wrote, no the, problem. wrote the wrong thing here. It's an interrogative pronoun because it's not followed by a noun. So the uh, second caller was also correct, right? Um, which is our pronoun here. And the word plants is a noun. So that makes it an interrogative adjective. So we're going to move on to number three. Hi, good evening. Welcome to see results. Hi, evening. This is Nicholas. I know that already, Nicholas. All right. So, <laughs> so, um, so number three, right? Yes. Whatever do you mean is an in interrogative pronoun and plus I'm good news for you. <laughs> What's the good news, Nicholas? Um, today we was doing our, I was cracking up then going to see level right? Pass paper. Uh -huh. And I got 84 out of 19 in mathematics. Well, Nothing great. was the highest mark. Oh my God, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Nicholas, you always make us proud, okay? And I'm sure Suija is also proud and he probably, you know, is wishing that this was actually a math segment, right? Yeah. But great news anyway, so thank you so much for that. Okay. Right, so Nicholas, great job to you and to all the students, you know, who are seeing improvement in your work. That is exactly what we want. We want you to improve and do the best that you can do, right, to get you ready for that SE exam. So great job there, Nicholas. And also, he is also correct um, with number three. So whatever here, that's your pronoun. And it is not followed by a noun. So that makes it an interrogative pronoun. Right? I uh, have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to Series Hi. Hi, good evening. What's your name? Zaria. Hi, Zaria. So we're on to number four. What mm -hmm. is the answer here? Interrogative adjective. All right. Point out the pronoun for me in this um, question. Ka. No, the pronoun. Who, who. Whose. You are correct. And ka will be our noun. So noun. you are correct. It's an interrogative adjective. adjective. Great job. Thank you so much for calling. Okay. Right. We're on to number five. Whom should I say is calling? And number six, what time will the plane arrive? So I'm just going to give students a few minutes, you know, call us and give us the answer for number four and five. And we have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to Series Results. Hi, evening. Hi, good evening. Um, the answer, right? Yes. So number five is whom should I, whom should I say is calling? It's supposed to be an inter interrogative pronoun. Why? Because the... Nothing is coming after um, whom. Whom, very good. And whom here is our pronoun, right? Yeah. Okay, great job once again. Yeah, I am Nicholas. Yes, I, yes, Nicholas. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Nicholas likes to make himself known, right? Great job. And we have a caller on the line to help us with number six. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Good evening. Hi, welcome. What's your name? Forrest. Nice to have you with us. So, what is the answer for number six? It is an interrogative pronoun. No, uh, sorry, adjective. How do you know that? What is a pronoun in the sentence? The pronoun is what. What, right. Wait. And it is followed by the word time and a part of speech. For the word time is actually a noun. So, you yeah. are correct. An interrogative adjective. Thank okay. you so much, caller. Right, so we're going to stop the calls there until we have the next activity. And great job to everyone who called and of course to you at home who, you know, is also doing this quiz along with us. You may not be calling, but I'm sure you are taking notes mentally or some of you are actually writing it down, right? So all of that is great. 
So let's just review a couple of these to make sure that we have it correct. So if we look at number one, who told him to open the door? So we know that the pronoun here is who, and following the pronoun, we have the word told. And told is actually a verb and not a noun. So once this is not a noun, we know that it's an interrogative pronoun. And if we look at number six, what time will the plane arrive? We have identified um, our pronoun, which is what. And following the pronoun, we have the word time. The part of speech for that word time is actually a noun. noun time there is a noun. So therefore, it makes it an interrogative adjective. So I hope all of you, you know, got this. And if you need some practice, that is fine. Make sure and do so early. So let's move on to our uh, next type of pronoun, which is called indefinite pronouns. Now, when you hear the word indefinite, what do you think about, right? Um, the indefinite do not indicate the exact number of persons or things to which it refers, right? So this is opposite to definite, right? It's not telling us exactly, just as we saw earlier on, well, not earlier on, but yesterday, uh, more precisely, right? So indefinite pronouns do not indicate the exact number of persons or things to which it refers. Now, uh, you have to look at these words carefully. We use them all the time, right? But you must realize that the word any or some, anybody, anyone, none, all of these are indefinite. They are not telling us a number. We don't know for sure. So everyone, who is everyone? We don't know. Nothing or another, few, none, several. So just um, be mindful of all these words here. And you don't have to memorize it. You know, when you come across such words, such indefinite pronouns, you will know by meaning that these are indefinite and it does not give you an exact number, right? So you don't have to learn it off. You just have to know or be aware of indefinite pronouns. Now, what is more important with indefinite pronouns is the subject verb agreement. Now we did look at a lot of rules and we uh, completed in fact quite about, actually about 18 rules or so with subject verb agreement and we discussed all of this. So when you're looking at indefinite pronouns such as many, several, ones, few, any, all of those, you have to be aware of the verb that follows. So let's look at these examples here. Many of the mangoes were still green. So here we have many being our indefinite pronoun. So, but if you look at the verb that follows, it's actually plural. Many of the mangoes itself here is plural. So it will be followed by a plural verb. Several of the students were absent. Again, several of the students indicates that it is plural in meaning. Right, so it is followed by a plural verb. What about number three? Has anyone seen the car keys? You will notice we did not say have anyone, but has anyone. Anyone is singular in meaning. So therefore we say has and not have. And uh, if you are not sure about this rule, please go back to our videos and it's not actually one, probably about three videos we have with subject verb agreements. Go through all, you know, familiarize yourself and do some exercises, you know, to, do, to get some practice with all the rules. Because it's very easy for us to forget, um, you know, that a singular subject may take a singular verb and that singular verbs um, end in S and all of these little things, right, we need to be mindful of. So it's okay to go back and check it over, you know, and rewatch them over and over if you need to, right? You should not feel any way about that. Number four. No one is allowed in the room. Similarly with no one, singular in meaning, right? So no one is, is here singular. No one is allowed in the room. Number five, all the seats, so all the seats here is plural, followed by a plural verb. All the seats were occupied in the cinema. And number six, just like number five, um, but look at this, all the food was devoured by the greedy dog, right? So. Here we have the noun seats, but here we have the noun food, singular, plural. So pay attention to your subject, right? Subject, all the food was, not all the food were, food is singular. All the food was devoured by the greedy dog. 
So just be mindful of your indefinite pronouns and the verbs that follow. So of course we are going to test you. So the lines are going to be open. Call us, you know, and help us. Um, or give us the correct verb to complete the sentences here, right? It's following the indefinite pronouns and the, rule that, the rules that we just discussed. And of course, it's testing your previous knowledge, especially if you have been following C results from the very beginning. You know that we did a lot of work in um, this area with subject verb agreements. So by now, you should be, you know, on a game, so to speak. All right, so let's look at number one. Some of my friends has or have visited England, right? So you have to know if that's singular or if it's plural. Let's see if the caller on the line can help us. Good evening, caller, and welcome to See Results. Hi. Hi, good evening. What's your name? Zaria. Hi, Zaria. Welcome back. So what is the answer for number one? Some of my friends have visited England. How do you know it's have and not has? Because friends is plural. You are correct. And if I say some, am I asking you for one? No. Or am I saying one? No, that is also plural. So you are correct. Thank you, Zaria, yeah. for calling. Right, so while, thank you. So yes, she's saying my friends, um, that's plural as well, but the word some, that is also plural. Right, we have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to See Results. Hi, evening. This is Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas. So what is the answer for number two? Everyone knows the answer. S or no S? S. S. Great job, Nicholas. Yeah. Right? So everyone here, thank you so much for calling. So okay. everyone is also singular in meaning, right? So it's followed by a singular verb. And if you look at this verb here, it ends in S. We have to be reminded that the verbs, singular verbs rather, end in S. And we have another call on the line to help us with number three. Good evening, caller. Welcome yeah. to see results. We have another call on the line. Good afternoon. Hi, welcome. What's your name? Caitlin Lochan. Hi, Caitlin. Hi. What is the answer for number three? Caitlin Lochan. Hi, Caitlin. What is the answer for number three? Several of the birds were fed on time. Very good. Several of the birds were fed on time. Thank you so much for calling and giving us your answer. We have another caller. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hello. Hi, good evening. What's your name? Kevin Chen. Nice to have you with us, Kevin. So, number four, what is the answer? Correct verb there. Is? Is. Are you guessing? No. <laughs> okay, you are correct, Kevin. All right, so I'll explain that shortly, right? I just want to take one more call to help us with number five, and then we're going to go through these sentences. Yes, good evening, caller. Welcome to See Results. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Amani Mary. Nice to have you with us. What is the answer for number five? All, all the bags were filled with garbage. Are you guessing? No. Okay, great job. Thank you so much for calling. All right, so we're going to stop the calls there and we're just going to go through these five sentences. So, first, you, uh, if you're given a sentence such as this and you have to give the correct verb, here's how you do it, right? You know that the word some is an indefinite pronoun. So you highlight or you just be aware, you know, mentally that the word some is indefinite. It does not give you an exact number. You already know that and now you have to combine it with your knowledge of subject verb agreement. So some there is plural in meaning. If I say some of my friends, I don't mean one. I mean more than one. If I wanted to say one, I would say uh, one of my friends, and that will make it singular. Here, we're saying some of my friends. So we know that it's plural. Hence the reason we chose a plural verb. Looking at number two, where it says everyone knows the, the answer. Everyone here is our indefinite pronoun. Also, everyone is singular in meaning. Therefore, it is followed by a singular verb. Hence the reason we chose knows instead of no. So everyone knows the answer. Number three, several of the birds were fed on time. Again, several here is plural, right? Um, not only is birds plural, but several of the birds were, right? So plural subject takes a plural verb. And we have our indefinite pronoun several. Number four, we have our indefinite pronoun anybody. 
which is also singular, just like number two where we have everyone. Anybody is followed by a singular verb. Singular subject, singular verb. Anybody is invited to the show. And number five, all is our indefinite pronoun. All the bags were. So we did not say one of the bag. We said all the bags. So it will be followed by a plural verb. All the bags were filled with garbage. So great job there, callers. And thank you so much for your contribution. Let's now move on to possessive pronouns. Now, possessive pronouns, and shortly we're going to come across possessive adjectives, right? Um, it's very uh, closely related, so it's very easy for you to be confused with. So pay attention to uh, our possessive pronouns, you know, the list of possessive pronouns, and then, of course, to the list of possessive adjectives. Now, when we hear the word possessive, we are already thinking about ownership, right? You own something or somebody owns something. So possessive pronouns shows ownership or possession. That's simple. Now, what do you need to know, however, is the list of possessive pronouns and how they would differ from the possessive adjectives. So you will notice mine, the word mine here, right? If I wrote M-I-N-E-S. Is this correct, right? And if you are saying no, you are correct, right? So there is no such word as minds. There is no such word as minds. Mine is singular, right? So this is mine and not mine. So you will not say this bag is mine, right? So I want you to pay attention to that, not only for your writing. Sometimes when we are speaking, you know, it's easy for us to say, well, this is mine, okay? So just be aware of that. So let's move on with the list. Mine, yours, his, hers, its, ours, theirs. Now, what do you notice about the possessive pronouns? Like, for instance, with yours or hers, its, ours, and theirs. Right? They all end with S. Of course, his all naturally ends with S. But yours, its, ours, theirs, and hers, they all end with S. So that's an easy way for you to remember your possessive pronouns. And you're going to see, um, if you're not sure why I'm saying that, you will see shortly when I show you the demonstrative adjectives, how that rule, or that li not rule rather, um, like a clue, right, is going to make sense to you. So let's look at some sample type sentences or, and questions. Have you given hers to her father? Have you given hers to her father? So we have the possessive pronoun hers here, right? So, and her uh, object pronoun. So have you given hers to her father? Number two, this book is mine and that one is yours. Number three, these tickets are yours, not his. So you see how you can use your possessive pronouns and your object pronouns together. Similarly, as we did yesterday, we use um, the subject pronouns and the reflexive pronouns together. And now we are looking at possessive adjectives. A possessive adjective sits before a noun. So a possessive adjective still shows ownership. But here's the difference. A possessive adjective sits before a noun or a pronoun to show who or what owns it. Again, a possessive adjective sits before and this is important since before a noun or a pronoun to show who or what owns it. Um, all the time we were looking at nouns coming after the, the pronoun. In this case, with a possessive adjective, it sits before a noun, um, which is actually the same thing, right? So I do apologize for that. So it sits before a noun. Just as we had uh, the pronouns just now, and the nouns coming after is the same thing. It's just saying here, sits before a noun. So let's look at the list here. My, your, our, their, his, her, and its. Right? Um, you would notice here the only possessive adjective here ending with an S is the word its. The rest of them are actually, right, um, just ending just as they are without that S. As we have seen with the possessive pronouns like yours and ours and so on, end with an S. 
So that's the difference there and how you can identify it. Let's look at the example. Her door was locked at the time. Now we said that a possessive adjective sits before a noun. So here, we know that this becomes a possessive adjective. Her door was locked at the time, right? Whose door? So we know it's her door. And here it becomes a possessive adjective because we have the door after the possessive adjective. Just as in number two, I forgot my school bag on the bench outside. Of course, this is a clue for us, the possessive adjective itself. But then we have the noun coming right after, right? So her door and my school bag. Both of them, you would see that your noun is coming after the possessive adjective. Here is a nice table that summarizes what we just did. And it's going to help you, if you can just zoom in here a bit, it's going to help you to understand um, the use of your possessive adjectives and the possessive pronouns. So here we have your possessive adjectives. And right here we have your possessive pronouns. So you would see your possessive adjective here follows a noun, right? Or a noun is followed by it. You have my, and in the possessive pronoun case, we have mine. So you will use my for a possessive adjective and mine to show possessive pronoun. Let's look at the example. This is my book, right? And if it's a possessive pronoun, this book is mine. Look at the arrangement of the words, right? This book is mine. Your, that is, is that your umbrella, right? So following your adjective here, your possessive adjective is your noun. And yours, is this yours? We don't have a noun following that possessive pronoun. His, he lent me his pen. Again, the word pen is a noun and follows the possessive adjective. His again. This pen is his, shows a, it is a possessive pronoun. We do not have a noun following the possessive pronoun. Rather, the noun is before in that sentence. Her, I borrowed her hat. Your noun is after your possessive adjective once more. And hers, the hat is hers. Its bone is old, right? Its bone, so your bone is a noun. In this case, its main character is Elsa. Its main character is Elsa. That's a possessive pronoun. This is our car, right? Um, following our possessive adjective is the word car, which is also a noun. And ours, that car, is ours. And their house is lovely. That house is theirs. So what I'm essentially showing you here, you can use, you know, for the same sentence, rearrange or the same group of words, rearrange it to form your possessive adjective or to form your possessive pronoun. You must know the difference, especially with the pronouns, the possessive adjectives and the possessive pronouns. And here you can see it side by side. So it's easy for you to understand. My, mine, your, yours, his, will remain his, her, hers, it's, same as it's, our, ours, their, and theirs, right? So now we're going to look at a couple sentences. Feel free to call us. What I want you to do, tell me whether the sentence is a possessive pronoun or if it's a possessive adjective. Remember for it to be a possessive adjective. Um, of course, the pos um, possessive adjective must exist itself and it must be followed by a noun, right? So those are two things we are looking for. So I'm just going to go back to this page until we have a caller, right? Look at the possessive adjective, look at the possessive pronoun, and memorize it in the meantime. We have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Welcome to see results. Good evening, caller. Yes. Okay, hi. Welcome to see results. What's your name? Josiah Sampa. Nice to have you with us. So we're on to number one here. Is this a possessive pronoun or possessive adjective? Possessive pronoun. Okay, first of all, right, what is the what is a possessive pronoun here then? Him. Him, right? And following following the possessive pronoun, him is the word 
those who are demonstrative pronoun, right, as we know them. Um, so is that word a noun or not? No, it's no. not a noun. Right, so therefore it's a possessive. Adjective. Okay. If it's a possessive adjective, it will have a noun following it. And if it's not, it will be a possessive pronoun. So is, the, is a noun following the possessive um, pronoun here? Call are you there? No. no. Yeah. So, right. So is this a possessive pronoun or possessive adjective? Possessive adjective. Okay, I'm going to say that again. So we have the possessive pronoun here, which is him. Right, we have identified the pronoun here, which is him. And following the word him is the word those. For it to be a possessive adjective, the word that comes right after the pronoun must be a noun. Is the word those a noun? No. No, so therefore it is a possessive what? Pronoun. Pronoun. Do you understand that by chance? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for calling. Right? Bye. Okay. So don't worry. I'm going to re explain it once I have answered all the sentences here, right? Uh, we have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to See Results. Uh, sentences here, right? I have another caller on the line. Hi, good evening. Hi. Hi, welcome. What's your name? Armani Mary. Nice to have you with us. What is the answer for number two? Hi. A possessive adjective. Right, so what is your possessive adjective in the sentence? Who. Who, and what will be your noun? Book. Book. Books, right? So you are correct. Right, so it's a possessive adjective. Thank you so much for calling. Okay. We have another caller to help us with number three. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Michaela. Hi, Michaela. What is the answer for number three? The answer for number three is my because food is a noun. So it is a possessive adjective. Very good. A possessive adjective. Adjective. Right? You are correct. Thank you so much for calling. No problem. Possessive adjective. We have another caller to help us with number four. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Okay, I think we lost that call there. We have another caller. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Good evening. Hi, my name is Jacob. Hi, Jacob. What is the answer for number four? The answer for number four is it's. It's, so we know that's, that's a pronoun. So. The possessive pronoun. All right, so let's see. We know that if it's a possessive pronoun, after the, the, the pronoun, it, we will, have, we will not have a noun, rather. And if we do have a noun after the pronoun, it makes it a possessive adjective. So is the word smell a noun? No. Why not? Read a because sentence. I'm not saying to smell. I'm saying its smell is unbearable. Yes, it is a noun. It is a noun in this case, right? So therefore, yeah. it's a possessive what? Adjective. Adjective. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay, great job. Thank you for calling. All right? So we're moving on to number five. I want yours to carry to school. And number six says, theirs are still in the bag. Right? So I'm going give, to um, give it a minute for somebody else to call. And we do have a caller. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Hi, what's your name? Nima Finley again. Hi, so what is the answer for five, number five? Yours. Right. So yours, we have the pronoun yours, but is it a possessive pronoun or a possessive adjective? Possessive. Possessive adjective. So if it's a possessive adjective. So pronoun. Right, tell me why. Because you, because carry is. Uh, no. no, but you skipped the carry, but what about the word two? Two is not a noun. Two right? is a noun. Is a noun or not a noun? No. Not. <laughs> All right. Great job. Thank you for calling. 
Right, now we're going to take one last call to help us with number six. Good evening, caller. Welcome to Series Else. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Jetra Baro. Nice to have you with us. So, what is the answer for number six? The answer is possessive pronoun. Possessive? Because, because it's not followed by a noun. Right, so it's a possessive. What, what did you say? A possessive pronoun. Pronoun. Right, because it is not followed by a noun. So you are correct. So thank you so much for calling. Right, and we're going to, of course, pause with the calls a little bit and just recap what we just did. So we are looking at possessive adjectives. We're just going to zoom in here. We are looking at possessive adjectives and possessive pronouns. We know that a possessive adjective, or for it to be a possessive adjective, it must be followed by a noun. Once it is not followed by a noun, that is your possessive pronoun or your pronoun in general. Once it is not followed by a noun, it becomes a possessive pronoun. And here we have all the possessive adjectives and here we have all the possessive pronouns. Now, one hint is for you to actually know your, possessive, your pronouns, right? Whether it's possessive pronouns or possessive adjectives, you must know them. Another hint is that if it's followed by a noun, just as in this case here where... The possessive adjective is followed by, or the pronoun my is followed by a noun. We know it's a possessive adjective. So that is what we are looking at. So in number one, give him those if you don't want them. Following the pronoun him, we have the word those, right? So therefore, it's not a noun. So we know that this is a possessive pronoun. Number two, her books are on the shelf. We have the pronoun her being followed by a noun. So therefore, this is a possessive adjective. Number three, please give my food to the little boy. We have the, your, your pronoun being followed by a noun. Food is a noun. So therefore, it's a possessive adjective. Number four says its smell is unbearable. So we have the pronoun its. Now, this one can be tricky because when you hear the word smell, you are naturally inclined to think it's a verb, right? Um, but in this case, if you read the sentence properly, and this is where instructions come, um, come in to play, and reading your sentences carefully is important, where it says, it smell, right? It smell, not I smell, right? Or I smell um, fruits or something like that, or it has a fruity smell, or all of those things. It smell is unbearable. Right here, smell is actually a noun, making this a possessive adjective. And number five, I want yours to carry to school. You have your pronoun yours um, being followed by the word to, which is not a noun. So therefore, it's a possessive pronoun. And of course, number six, theirs are still in the bag. Theirs is followed by helping verb are, making it a possessive pronoun. And of course, if you did not know that and you knew that theirs is actually a possessive pronoun, right? That will help you to figure out the answer as well, right? So great job once again, and thank you guys for calling. So we are on to distributive pronouns, but I'm just going to take a quick water break, and I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere, guys. See you in a couple minutes. prices and all grocery items trust low-cost supermarket for the widest variety of quality products at low prices freshly picked fruits and vegetables healthy products for your well-being high quality meat cuts and a warm and friendly service low-cost supermarket sun and main road Kunupia.
Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys and welcome back to see results. Just before the break, uh, we were looking at we were looking at possessive adjectives and possessive pronouns. We are now finished with this topic and we are moving on to our next set of pronouns, which is actually distributive pronouns. So I know it's a lot of different types of pronouns, but don't worry, this is a great refresher, right? You would have done this at some point in school. Um, problem maybe is that you don't have or didn't have enough practice. So don't worry, guys. This is what we are here for, to help you along the way. So this is the extra practice that you need, right? And I do hope that, you know, if any of this is new to you, um, that you take your notes, take the notes that are necessary and revise them once you are finished and do some extra work. If these um, activities that we do are not enough, right? Sometimes you may need to do an extra, acti an extra activity, sorry, to help you, right? Uh, you shouldn't feel any way about that and you should do it and encourage your friends as well to do the same, right? So let's move on to distributive pronouns. So we know that a distributive pronoun Right, or distributive pronouns refer to each person or thing separately and not collectively. They refer to persons or thing, things one at a time. So it's like you're distributing something, right? One at a time. They, don't re they, don't, they are not um, speaking or referring to something collectively or as a group, right? So each and everything here is referred to separately. Now let's look at some distributive pronouns. Right? For example, neither, either, each, none, any. Just as we came across um, in the sentences before where we saw um, has anyone, and we said that anyone is singular, right? Um, just as with neither, either, each, none, and any, all of these um, are separated or referred to separately, right? And if you look at the sentences here, Right, for example, each of the boys was given a present. Now, this is closely linked to the rules. Of course, again, I'm going to say this to the subject verb agreement rules that we just covered. Right, so all of these are singular in meaning and therefore uh, requires a singular verb. So this is what you need to know here. You need to put your knowledge of distributive pronouns um, together with those rules. So here we have the distributive pronoun each. So do I do not want you to be confused by of the boys, right? Here it's saying each, right? So it's singling, singling out or separating something. Each of the boys was given a present. You would notice here the verb is singular because your subject is singular. Your subject is not the boys, right? That is not your subject. Do not be confused by that. We're saying each of the boys was given a present. Likewise, in number two, neither of the girls attends the school regularly or attends school regularly, right? So here we have neither um, being your distributive pronoun and it is followed by a singular verb. Now, this will go with the rule neither of or either of. Similarly, when your subject um, such as each and uh, <coughs> any of those a singular meaning to take a singular verb. And with neither of and either of, a singular verb is required. So you must know that as well. So it's not just to say that you, well, you know your distributive pronouns or you are able to identify them. You must be able to use it in a sentence correctly. Right? So subject and verb, really important. Now here, just as we have been... Um, Looking at some types of adjectives as we are coming across them, we are going to look at distributive adjectives, right? So it's similar to the pattern that we have been following all along with nouns coming after your distributive adjectives. Adjectives, so you just have to know which distributive adjectives and so on. So distributive adjectives show whether the noun is thought of as singly or collectively, right? So now... This is where it gets different. It's going to tell you whether the noun is thought of as one or as a group. When neither, either, every and each is followed by nouns. They are called distributive adjectives. So before we had neither and either when followed by of, it was singular in meaning and required a singular verb. Here, they are telling you when neither, either, every or each 
is followed by nouns. They are called distributive adjectives. So look out for that. Let's look at the example and see. Each day we pray reverently. So each is our pronoun and then we have the word day being a noun. Therefore, this becomes a distributive adjective, right? And just as in number two, neither is our pronoun and then you have child being a noun. So it becomes a distributive adjective. So neither child knows the answer to the riddle, right? Um, so the rule is not changing, right? So be, be mindful of that. But you need to know in this case, right, when neither, either, every or each is followed by nouns, they are called distributive adjectives, right? So we have a couple of sentences here and we just have about five minutes or so before, you know, time is up for ELA. So we're going to take some quick calls to help us, you know, answer these or tell us what type of sentence they are, whether it's a distributive whether it's a distributive adjective or a distributive pronoun. Just remember for a distributive adjective, we are looking for a noun, but they must be followed by the words neither, either, every, each. So there are four distributive adjectives that must be followed by nouns in order for it to be, not distributive adjectives, but pronouns that must be followed by nouns in order for them to become distributive adjectives. So that's again, neither, either, every, and each. So we have a call on the line. Good evening, caller. Yeah. Welcome to see results. Hello, good evening. Hi, what's your name? Kaylee Santa. Hi, Kaylee. So what is the answer for number one? Descriptive adjective. Um, not descriptive, but distributive. Sorry, distributive. Right. How do you know it's a distributive adjective? Because girl is unknown. Girl is unknown and we know that once this follows, thank you so much for calling, by the way, right? Um, so guys, every here is our pronoun and it's one of those that says, you know, it must be followed by a noun in order for it to be a distributive adjective, right? And of course, I will come back to that and re-explain it. We have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Um, hello. Hi, what's your name? Ishani. Hi, Ishani. What's the answer for number two? Um, number two. Yes. Um, okay. So no one. Uh huh. Is, and uh. So no one uh, is our what here? Is our pronoun? Uh, is pronoun, our yeah. pronoun right? And um, well, there there is no there is no noun. Right. So it'll be an, a distributive uh, pronoun. Excellent job, Ishani. Right, so she is correct there. No one isn't followed by a noun, so it becomes a distributive pronoun. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. I'm not hearing this caller. Please hang up. Have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hello. Hi, good evening. What's your name? Hi, good evening. Okay, so we lost that call again. Mm -hmm. Alright. Oh, are you there, caller? Okay. We have another I'm caller. Calling. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Yes. Hi, Hi, what's your name? Welcome to Hello? Hi, good evening. Welcome to see results. Hello. What's your name? Hi, good evening. What's your name? Um Rashid Hussein. Hi Rashid. So what is the answer for number three? Um, number three. Mm -hmm. um, number three. Sorry. Um, what is the pronoun in the sentence? Any. Any. And following the word any, is it a pro? Is it a noun or no? Okay. I think we lost that call there. But following. Um, the pronoun any is not a noun, therefore, it is a distributive pronoun, right? So, thank you so much for calling. And we have number four and five to complete, and we have a call on the line to help us. Good evening, call and welcome to see results. Hello, hi, good evening, welcome. What's your name? 
Kelly Spencer. Hi, Kelly. So, what is the answer for number four? The should be self active. Okay, so first of all, what is the um, pronoun in the sentence? Each. Each. And it's followed by a noun, so therefore it's a distributive. Active. Great job, Kaylee. Thank you so much for calling. All right, and we have a final caller to end up um, to help us wrap up today's episode. Good evening, caller, and welcome to See Results. Okay, I'm not sure. We lost that one there. Hello. Okay, good evening. Welcome to See Results. My name is Rafael Samba again. Hi. So, what is the answer for number five? None. Okay, so we know none, none is the what here? Is the pronoun? Yes. Right, and following that pronoun, is, is there a noun? Right after the pronoun, none. Is there a noun? Uh, sorry, a noun? No. Right, so therefore this is a what? This should be? Pronoun. A distributive? pronoun so you are correct right thank you so much for calling right so that's it there guys um we are out of time basically i uh, just want to recap this really quickly and just as a reminder for distributive adjectives or in order for it to become a distributive adjective we must remember that there are four pronouns that must be followed by a noun neither either every and each so that's easy to remember and plus a noun to make it a distributive adjective. And in the case as number three here, I haven't seen any of the new movies. Any is our pronoun and it is followed by of, which is not a noun. So therefore it is a distributive pronoun. So guys, I know we did a lot of work today and um, you know, some of you are having cognitive overload, but you know, take a bite of dark chocolate refresh yourself, drink some water, and join us back right here at 6 p.m. because, we, of course, we're going to have creative writing. And you know today is Tuesday, so we have so you just join us to highlight some of your work. So don't go anywhere, guys, and join us back at 6 p.m. sharp for creative writing. prices on all grocery items trust low cost supermarket for the widest variety of quality products at low prices freshly picked fruits and vegetables healthy products for your well-being high quality meat cuts and a warm and friendly service low cost supermarket Southern Main Road Kunupia Chicly Show Limited, the Caribbean's largest manufacturers of plain and printed paper bags, leaders in plastic bags, vermicelli, spit piece powder, and greaseproof paper, ideal for doubles, french fries, and sandwiches. Supplying stores nationwide. For quality products, trust Chicly Show Limited, 665-3336.
content can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an over-pumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screens for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys and welcome back to See Results. And if you're just joining me, I'm Miss Naila and now we have our creative writing segment. I just want to say good afternoon um, and welcome to all our viewers, you know, whether you're watching us on IBN TV channel 8 or on our live stream on Facebook via the See Results page or on IBN TV page. Right, so welcome one and all. So creative writing today, we are on the topic of elements of a story. So we are doing narrative style writing. We are coming to an end with um, this style of writing and soon we'll be moving on to expository style writing. So guys, I know some of you are excited and anxious for that. So don't worry, that's just around the corner, right? We just have a couple things to tie up and then we'll be on our way. So elements of a story. We already covered um, setting, description of time, place, etc. We looked at characters. Um, their physical appearance, uh, their emotions, whether it was a human character or a non-human character, right? So we are now on to the plot. Um, the plot here has a lot to work with. We have to look at the exposition of a story, the rise in action, your climax, your fall in um, action, your resolution, right? So all of those are things that we have to look at. And then we'll be looking at conclusion, how to wrap up a story in general, right? So we have a lot of things to do today. So here I have for you, um, and I'm just going to recap this. We started it last day, but time was up. So we're just going to go through this before we move forward. Here, what I have is a plot diagram. It gives us, you know, like a brief explanation of everything, you know, that we must cover and what is required of us for a plot. So like we said in the exposition, right, that's the beginning of a story where characters and setting are introduced. So in the beginning of a story, you must know, you know, um, at least some of your characters. It, of course, each story will be different. It may not be two, three, four characters, might be one, right? Something like that. But we, you must establish your character and your setting, right? We must know where the story is taking place. And as we have learned in setting, um, your setting can change throughout your story. And we do encourage you to try something like that, you know, change up your setting throughout your story. Then we have the rise in action. Now, what is the rise in action in your story? This is where the, the main character faces a series of conflicts. And then your climax, 
Your climax, climax is the most exciting part of the story, right? So here, it's all the excitement and fun, you know, pause, raising, suspense building, all those things is where the climax comes in. And then your fall in action, uh, those are the events leading to the end of the story, right? Your, secre your sequence of actions or steps to tell us, you know, how the problem was fixed and so on. Your resolution is the end of the story, simply. What we are going to do, um, we, last day we had a story here and we are going to read this, this story or this piece of writing and then we are going to put it into the plot examination. We are going to find out, you know, we are going to examine what is the exposition, right? We're going to show you how it was established. We're going to look at the um, conflicts or conflicts arising in that story as well as the climax of it, the fall in action. So all those are things we must examine in the upcoming story. So, but first we must read this story just to refresh your minds. So of course you can read along with me. You are playing a game, or this is the topic here. You are playing a game, a cricket, sorry, you are playing a cricket game with your friends when suddenly the ball was accidentally hit into the neighbor's window. Write a story about the events that led to the incident, how you felt and how you went about trying to retrieve the ball. Um, just as I did last day, what I told you all, um, once you get your topic and you have decided what you are writing on, highlight the key parts, you know, things that you must mention in your story, things that is specifically asked you for, and you must stay on the topic given, right? We do not want to stray. Strain will cause us to lose marks. We can't afford to lose any marks in our, in our narrative piece. So you are playing a game of cricket. You know it's a cricket game, right? So you can't start with a football game. They told you the scenario, it's a cricket game with your friends when suddenly the ball was accidentally hit into the neighbor's window. So you will not say he did it for spite. It's an accident. Write a story about the events that led to the incident. So you must tell us things that were happening before that incident took place. How you felt. Emotions are extremely important throughout your story. I cannot stress that enough, right? and how you went about trying to retrieve the ball. So those are the, those are the steps or the things you must discuss, right, for, for us to have our rise in action and, of course, the climax. So let's see how this story unfolds. So let's, you can read with me. Crash, the green fuzzy ball went straight through my neighbor's window, which was carelessly left open. The cricket game was tied. My team was just about to win when a powerful sixth sent the ball flying across to Mr. Nelson's yard and into his front window. Sadly, my neighbor, Mr. Nelson, was not at home. My friends and I packed up our paraphernalia and marched inside. Everyone was disappointed. We sat on the comfortable furniture and watched an exciting movie. Hopefully, we thought it would make us stop thinking about the cricket match. However, the euphoria I felt during the match weighed heavily on my restless mind. I could no longer wait. When no one was looking, I songlessly crept outside and bolted to my neighbor's wide gate. I stealthily tiptoed over the lush green grass to the window. Without hesitating, hesitating, I skillfully climbed through the window. I swiftly scanned the area to ensure that no one had seen me. Then I began to search frantically. I searched under wooden chairs and the table. I was about to give up when I saw a green object, my ball. At last, I found it, I exclaimed. As I bent down to pick up the ball, a frisson of unease entered my body. As I looked on at the broken, ancient vase that I had momentarily knocked over, I could feel the blood throbbing at my temples. What on earth could possibly make this day worse? I murmured to myself. Then I heard a loud jiggling of keys. Mr. Nelson had arrived. Fear multiplied by the second as an icy chill ran up and down my spine. I swiftly dashed to his spacious bedroom and rolled on the dirty floor and under his bed. I felt like the unluckiest girl in the world. There were several webs, but the monsters were nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, the largest spider I had ever seen crawled on the web above my head. I wanted to scream my lungs out, but there was a lump down my throat. 
It must have fallen accidentally, Mr. Nelson cried as he looked at the broken vase. Fortunately, he did not see the green ball. I glanced as my neighbor entered the washroom. I hustled out from under the bed and let out a sigh of relief. Then I hurried to, the to, to fetch the ball. Grr, it growled. Trepidation pervaded the atmosphere. I froze in fear. I had forgotten that Mr. Nelson had a dog. It hastened towards me with all its might and pierced my skin with its razor-sharp teeth. I unleashed a deafening shriek as the merciless hound sank its fangs through my flesh. Mr. Nelson bolted out of the washroom and commanded the beast to release me. The dog shockingly obeyed his, its master. I began to cry a bucket a drop. My right hand was bleeding profusely. Mr. Nelson's jaw dropped as he had no idea what was happening. He was clearly confused. Just then, my parents burst through the old rickety wooden door. It flew straight out of its hinges and landed on the floor with a loud bang. Their dark brown eyes widened as they looked on at the terrible sight. My caring mother took me to the dark blue car and sped down the narrow bumpy road to a nearby hospital, while my hard-working father dropped my good friend home. When the doctors were finished taking care of my wounds, I briefly explained everything to my family and my neighbor. Everyone was in a state of disbelief, including Mr. Nelson. He knew me as a very pleasant person and never expected me to invade someone's property. We paid Mr. Nelson for the damages done and apologized relentlessly. He saw how melancholy I was and said it was all right. When we arrived home, my parents scolded me and gave me a long and important lecture. This day would be deeply engraved on a golden plaque in my youthful mind for years to come. I definitely learned that trespassing is a violation of someone's privacy and property and must be avoided altogether. So this was written by Arian Jagru. Now, what is important here, um, we know we are not critiquing this piece, just be mindful of that, guys. What we want to do here, we want to establish the plot, right? We, we want to ensure that this, this story has all the elements necessary, right? So we're just going to look at that right after we come back. I'm just going to take a quick break and we'll be right back after this.
Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys and welcome back to See Results. So just before the break, uh, we read a story in our narrative style, right? Um, now what we are going to do, using that plot diagram that we just examined, uh, we are going to look and see, you know, this is the diagram here. We are going to look and we're going to find the exposition of that story that we just read, the rise in action, the climax, and the fall in action. Now the reason we are doing this, because I want you to, you know, I want you to be able to see why each step of this is necessary and how it can be displayed in your writing. And I also want to see if you were able to identify, right, um, you know, the exposition or the rise in action or the climax. You must also be able to identify those as well. So let's look for the exposition. And remember, we said that the exposition is the beginning of the story where characters and setting are introduced. So let's see if this here was established. So this was the introduction paragraph here. Um, so you can reread it or we can reread it together and we are going to look for characters and we are going to look for the setting or look at the setting. Crash, the green fuzzy ball went straight through my neighbor's window, which was carelessly left open. The cricket game was tied. My team was just about to win when a powerful six sent the ball flying across to Mr. Nelson's yard and into his front window. So, so far, right, um, what is the setting that you are getting, right? Where are you picturing? So, is there a setting being established here and have you come across any characters as yet? Let's go on. Sadly, my neighbor, Mr. Nelson, was not at home. My friends and I packed up our paraphernalia and marched inside. Everyone was, was disappointed. We sat on the comfortable furniture and watched an exciting movie. Hopefully, we thought it would make us stop thinking about the cricket match. So great. Here, and if you're at home, you know, you're looking on at this, I want you to be able to establish the setting as well. So first here, when they said the cricket game was tied, my team was just about to win. Before that incident took place, where do you think the children are playing? Right here, you can use your imagination. The setting can be on the street. Um, you can probably have a nearby park or a field probably to the back of their home, right? Um, probably not even that close to Mr. Nelson, but it had to be relatively close, right, for that six to hit through his window, that powerful, that powerful strike. So we know that setting there was first um, probably at a park or on the street or wherever. And then you can see the setting changed. After that incident took place, the children went inside. So notice, yes, it might still be in their village, but notice there was a change in setting. So before it's outdoors, now what tells us that it's indoors, he, we sat on the comfortable furniture and watched an exciting movie. Here it's telling us that they had a change in setting. So yes, the setting was established. And do we have characters? We certainly do. Mr. Nelson, our main character, or one of the main characters here, right, um, I might add, so we know Mr. Nelson, um, the person is speaking about themselves and he's also talking about his friends who he was playing ga the cricket game with. So was this child successful um, in the exposition? Yes, he was. The setting was established as well as the characters. Now it may not be all the characters, but that is fine. We have a clear idea about where the story is going. Now we are in search of the rising action. What did we say the rise in action was? And that's actually where the main character faces a series of conflicts. So here, let's see what are some of the conflicts this character is exposed to or they are going through. We read this paragraph. However, the euphoria I felt during the match weighed heavily on my restless mind. I could no longer wait. When no one was looking, I soundlessly crept outside and bolted to my neighbor's white gate. I stealthily tiptoed over the lush green grass to the window without hesitating. I skillfully climbed through the window. I swiftly scanned the area to ensure that no one had seen me. Then I began to search frantically. I searched under wooden chairs and table. I was about to give up when I saw a green object, my ball. Right, so here we are looking to see where the main character faces a series of conflicts. We haven't yet come across, right, um, where the conflicts are arising. So we can move on here. The first conflict, as we know, um, would have been or came from the first paragraph where the ball was hit 
through the neighbor's window. Now, that is the main conflict. That is the entire cause of the problem. So the ball was hit through the window. Now, what are some other conflicts that this person faced? Right? I'm probably just have a mix up there. But I'm just going to go back to this paragraph. Where? Good. At last, right, um, he found it. I exclaimed. We could probably just zoom on this screen here. As I bent down to pick up the ball, a free son of unease entered my body. So here's where all the problems are going to arise, or the conflicts coming out of that major problem. I looked on at the broken ancient vase. So here, he broke a vase. So now he's leaving a trail that he was inside the house. If he thought, when he thought actually that he was going to escape without a trace, right? I had moment, momentarily knocked over. I could feel the blood throbbing at my temples, right? And then I heard a loud jiggling of keys. That's another problem arising there. Why? Because Mr. Nelson is now home. He arrived at home. But what's happening? He is still inside the house and Mr. Nelson came home. Now here's where it gets tricky and fear, right? Fear is overtaking his body. It's because if you're, at, if you're in someone's house and they come home, what is going to happen? You are going to get caught. Maybe it wasn't his intention, but it happened anyways, right? So here is another problem. What is the problem? She is scared. There were several webs, but the monsters were nowhere to be seen. So now she is encountering a spider. Suddenly, the largest spider I had ever seen crawled out from the web above my head. Although she did not give, or he did not give additional information about the spider and gave a scenario about the spider, we can imagine. Right? She's in so, some sort of problem there. So she's facing a spider. She probably has a fear of spiders. And then now she has, has come face to face with the largest spider. So, you know, at any moment that spider could drop on her and, you know, make her scream, sell her out, give it away that she's hiding under his bed. So that's potentially a problem or a conflict there, right? She wanted to scream. Now, another problem. Uh, he noticed there that the vase was broken. However, he's thinking that it's an accident. So he is unaware still, but then I hustle out from under the bed and let out a sigh of relief. Here's where, you know, um, here's where things are going to get a little more interesting. So we are now going to move on. We are now going to move on to the climax of the story, right? So just before that, we looked at the rise in action, all the things you know, leading up to the climax, some of the problems that that character was facing, right? So first the ball was hit through the window, that's a problem. He started panicking. He felt like he had to go for the ball. He went into the house. Um, he broke a vase. Um, he then, he heard jiggling of keys. Mr. Nelson came home. Now what he have to do? Hide under the bed. Hiding under the bed, you know, trying to relax. And then uh, the largest spider, you know, you have ever seen, comes and crawls above your head. You are scared out of your mind. You do not know what to do, right? Blood is rushing through you. You are sweating profusely. Think about it, right? And just then, you know, as he makes his way to the washroom, you think you are going to get away. Let's see what the climax is in the story, the most exciting part. You know, I'm wondering, what do you think is the most exciting part of the story, right? You might have ideas as well, right? Um, here, uh, trepidation pervaded the atmosphere. I froze in fear. I had forgotten that Mr. Nelson had a dog. So here's a twist, right? He did not see this dog upon entering the house. He forgot completely that Mr. Nelson had a dog. Now he's trying to make his way out of the house. And what happens, right? Not only is he caught, but the dog hastened towards him and pierced his skin. So he was bitten by a ferocious dog. Uh, causing, you know, it wasn't um, just, you know, um, the dog, you know, biting him gently or playing with him or running him down. He was actually bitten, right? That blood now is gushing out of his flesh and the wound is deep. So he let out a very loud shriek. 
Now, when you scream that loudly, of course you are going to draw attention. So Mr. Nelson, now he, does, he didn't know that someone is, was in his house. He rushed out of the washroom and there he saw, you know, a person in his house. He, now he knows his child, right? And he thought of this child to be very pleasant and, you know, not one of those who would enter without permission and so on. But the climax in the story is definitely where the child was bitten, right? That's one idea where the child was bitten by the dog on his way out trying to escape thinking that he was about to escape but he was actually caught so now he's he was caught by mr nelson so he has no way right no chance of escaping without a trace everyone now knows that he is in that house make it even worse his parents are going you know heard that scream maybe uh, it was so loud they came over they rushed over they banged on the door the door fell and they caught him as well. They are disappointed. Not only Mr. Nelson disappointed, his parents are also disappointed in his behavior. Right? So that's the climax of your story there. You know, um, where he was bitten and then the parents came through and they found him in Mr. Nelson's house. And just going back here, events leading to the end of the story. And as you can recall, some of the events there will definitely be um, his parents coming into the scenario where they find him after they heard that scream and they discover what he did. He went to the doctor probably to get stitches. His father had to drop his friend home. His mom had to take him to the hospital, right? So those are the events leading to the end of the story, right? And now we are looking at the resolution or not the resolution, sorry, the end of the story. Right, so we know that he had to repay Mr. Nelson for the damages done. And of course, apologize. And there he learned his lesson. Right, so let's see if we covered all the elements in the plot itself. Did we find the exposition? Right, were we, be, were we able to establish characters and setting in the beginning of the story? Yes, we were. Rise in action, where the main character faces a series of conflicts. Yes, we saw where this character had a, quite a number of conflicts actually leading up to the climax of the story, uh, which was the most important, not the most important, sorry, the most exciting part of the story where he was caught. And then leading events leading to the end of the story, we have your fallen action. And we saw what happened in the end there after the child was caught and how that story played out in the end. And the lesson he learned from that story. So from looking at the plot here, an example as we read, going through it step by step, I hope you are seeing guys, you know, why it's important and how this builds your story. So yes, it's one thing to have your character and your setting, but you must be able, you know, to carry out the plot, you know, um, correctly. Or, so you must have your exposition, your rise in action and so on. So all of this is very important to make your story interesting and of course to make the story just as it should be with all the elements it will not be a proper story or a story that you know is worth 20 marks for instance if you don't have all the elements so be sure revise your story you can even use this plot diagram if you want right to check over your story well does my story have an exposition um is the reader able to um, get a sense of the setting and establish the character or characters. Will my reader be able to see the rise in action? Tell what are the problems um, that are arising? Will they be able to catch the climax, right? Is it wow? Is it suspense, right? Um, is it going to make it interesting? Is it really going to elevate your story? And you must also take into consideration your fallen action. Ask yourself, is, my, is the reader um, looking at the events leading to the end of the story? Can they see it? Do I have the proper events? Did I list them out? Can I add anything? Should I take away anything? You know, bearing all of this in mind, um, just keep in mind um, about supporting details, right? Uh, relevant and irrelevant details. You have to keep that in mind. You don't want to add irrelevant details to your story just to say, well, I need to add an extra event here or, or add a conflict or anything like that, right? Your story, reread it, use all that you have learned and make the story the best that you can.
please I encourage you guys to use this diagram it is helpful and you will see the benefits of it once you use it in your writing so that's about it there for elements of a story uh, what we're going to look at is just gonna help us briefly you know to conclude a story you know if you're looking at ways to conclude a story I'm gonna share a few with you just as I did before we started narrative style writing uh, where I helped you you know establish about 10 ways you can start a story or story starters now we are going to look at ways to end or to close off the last paragraph in your story now this is not pertaining to the story that we just read um, but this is for stories in general All right so let's take a look so you'll have an idea reveal oh, just give me one second okay so actually before I do that um, I was going to tell you that your last paragraph should have a couple things right so these are the things that your last paragraph in your story must have it must reveal how you overcame your problem right just as we saw the problem there in the beginning of the story was that the ball was hit into his neighbor's window how he overcame that problem tie up the entire story bringing it to a close right same thing there you must wrap up all loose ends if you give us a conflict um, tell us about it and how did it end deal with ending everything which happened in the introduction and body so if you told us that one of your friends were injured trying to get through the window we must know what happened to that friend impress the reader since it is the part of the story he or she will most likely remember right and of course we always try to give an impression after um, in our writing right or by our writing so let's move on to ways we can end our story stories can end in a variety of ways right so it's really up to you um, which option you prefer and it depends of course on your story so we'll probably look at one or two before we invite Sir Ijaz to we'll take a break um, for Sir Ijaz to join us because we are quickly approaching the end of time so let's see here number one you can end by using a question right so your story the last line in your story in your last paragraph can actually be a question for example you can say have you ever had such an experience you describe something for us right um, maybe something great something not so great right um, whether it was welcoming or scary whatever the situation is asking the reader have you ever had such an experience what would you have done maybe you did something um, you know to help and you did not like the way it turned out or maybe you did something really great and you did um, you know take the steps necessary to help that person in the best way possible and you're asking now well what would you have done in that situation put yourself there who was next I wondered probably some a sci-fi or something like that <clears throat> those type of story all right a thriller would you have risked your life for a complete stranger that's a great question right again it will depend on your topic try not to stray of course from your topic not because I used any of these questions here you can just randomly insert it in your writing that will not make sense you already know that so tie it into whatever you are writing right whatever the topic is so guys um, I'm just about out of time I need to take a break so that Sir Ijaz can join us don't go anywhere we'll be right back prices on all grocery items trust low-cost supermarket for the widest variety of quality products at low prices freshly picked fruits and vegetables healthy products for your well-being high quality meat cuts and a warm and friendly service low-cost supermarket Southern Main Road Kunupia
Good evening, assalamu alaikum, and welcome back to C Results on IBN TV Channel 8 and on the C Results Facebook page as well as the IBN TV Facebook page. I am your, well, not really your creative writing teacher, but I will be taking you through some of the submissions that our students on edmodo.com would have submitted um, over the weekend, all right? They would have actually submitted this Friday um, at 11.59 p.m. latest, all right? So the lovely thing about the creative writing submissions is that you are allowed to submit and to resubmit and to update your work until you find it to be, you know, satisfactory to you, all right? And of course, you should always bear in mind the tips and the tricks and the methods that Ms. Nyla is sharing with you, all right? So our task, um, which was given last Saturday, all right, uh, not this Saturday here, but the one prior to that, you would have been given an assignment based on the week's um, content before that, all right? So Ms. Nyla dealt a lot with emotions in that week, all right? She dealt with uh, some negative emotions as well as positive emotions. And this particular assignment has to do with a very positive one, all right? And it directly relates to the student's mindset um, about approaching the SEA exam. So we thought this was a very, you know, apt and interesting one to hear what the students have in their minds, all right? So let us look at the um, instructions for this particular assignment, all right? So it's describing emotions, all right? And the instructions were to write a paragraph with an emphasis on emotional description for the scenario given below. And you were asked to use as many creative writing tools as you can, um, all of those that were covered since the inception of this program, all right? And this is the scenario that you were given. All right, you have just left the SEA examination room satisfied with your performance after months of preparation, all right? The pressure is finally off. It's time to enjoy your lengthy vacation. Describe your emotions in that moment, all right? And there was even an accompanying picture, all right? And I imagine a lot of you might be in this state of mind after you've written your SEA exam, as a matter of fact, we very much hope that that is the case, all right? So if you're following along with us um, and you're practicing, you're doing your work at school, you're doing our quizzes and doing all the revision, all the necessary steps, of course, prayer is very important, all right? And keeping a positive attitude, a positive outlook, all right? Although the time is short, there's still time. So if you feel like you're a bit behind, now is the time to step up, all right? Now is the time to take action. And one way that you can do that, of course, is to visualize um, what you would feel like if you've done the work that you ought to have done, all right? So that is really what we wanted to hear from you in this particular assignment. So this is our first submission. So we're gonna take you to the screen now and I'll read it for you as well, all right? So exiting the classroom door, it finally dawned on her. SEA was finally over. The massive weight she shouldered for months now grew wings and fly away. All right, I love this expression, all right? So the, the expectation that the student had for months, all right, or the weight, sorry, it grew wings and it flew away, all right? Very nice descriptive language over there, all right? And it's not really a personification since, you know, human beings can't fly, but it is giving the the expectation or the weight, um, a quality that, you know, is not really uh, physically possible, but we get the metaphor, all right? So waves of relief washed over Lily, all right? Closing her eyes, she lost herself in the refreshing pool of calmness that settled over her, all right? This is really, really, really great writing, all right? Waves of relief washed over Lily, all right, closing her eyes, she lost herself in a refreshing pool of calmness that settled over her. So a lot of imagery here having to do with water, you know, coolness, calmness. You know, perhaps you might, you know, envision um, being at the beach or being in a wave pool or something like that. All right. And the warmth of happiness engulfed Lily like a blanket on a cold night. All right. So this student has really given this some thought, you know, how it is she is going to feel after completing her SEA exam, all right? 
So she began to laugh heartily, pumping the air with her fist as she jumped up and down, shrieking with joy. All right, so that is reminiscent of the picture that we put accompanying the instructions for the assignment. And feeling on top of the world and buzzing with excitement, she hastily headed home, her thoughts only of her best friend waiting patiently on her. All right? Oh, what fun they would have again. All right? And then she ends by um, speaking to herself. I'm coming, well, actually speaking home, speaking, sorry, to her tablet. I'm coming home, my tablet. I've missed you. Lily chuckled to herself as her legs went into overdrive, all right? So she's basically kicking rocks, running home, full speed ahead to that tablet to have some fun after all of the work that she put in, all right? And this was written by Caitlin Sunarine, all right? This is not the first time that we are featuring Caitlin's writing on the program. You know, Caitlin, I want to say that this is very, very, very good stuff, all right? She really lays out those emotions you know, and puts you um, as a student or as a prospective candidate for SEA into that state of mind, you know, that we hope you will be in after you've written your exam. Now, of course, it's not just about dreaming the dream, all right? You have to do the work to accompany it, of, to accompany it, of course, all right? But visualization is one step, all right? So if you want to feel like this, like how Caitlin has described her character, Lily feeling, of course, you need to put that effort in, and if you do, then, you know, at the end of the day, you will feel that relief and that satisfaction, and you will have a lot of uh, peace of mind as you await your results and enjoy that very long vacation, all right? So this was one piece that was done quite well, and kudos again to you, Caitlin, and to your mom, who is also a very avid fan on our C results page, all right? So we have another submission here by Faith Osborne, all right? Finally, it was over. The C exams, which seemed so far but yet so near, was concluded. A smile which was permanently glued to my face said it all, knowing to myself how good I felt about the test. All right, so hopefully here, this is more than just wishful thinking, all right? If you prepare yourself properly, you will feel good about the test, all right? So hopefully Faith actually feels this feeling at the end of the exam, and so too are all of our viewers, all right? The atmosphere felt new. My body that was once tense from anxiety was now relaxed, all right? So anxiety is an, an emotion, right? We're dealing with emotions here. And after the anxiety, she's feeling relaxed now that it's all over, all right? My cold, numb fingers were now warm. The butterflies that were in my stomach flew away. All right, marvelous. So in one essay, we had the wheat um, growing wings and flying away. Here we have the butterflies in our stomach, all right, which is an idiom, all right, for, for anxiousness or anxiety. They flew away, all right, so that feeling has left faith. I felt free. As I looked up to the sky, tears of joy streamed down to my cheeks, and the thought of myself enjoying my lengthy vacation was overwhelming, all right? So well done, Faith, excellent work, all right? And we want to emphasize, um, viewers, that if you see a come out of place here or there, all right, don't be alarmed. We give our students uh, feedback on these essays in addition to giving them um, a mark. Well, so far we haven't done complete essays. As you know, that might be a bit difficult to do. Perhaps we'll have one or two exercises like that coming down closer to SEA exam, but so far we are limiting the length of the submission so that we can read and review as much of them as possible, all right? Um, and of course, each time we, so we request these paragraphs, it is tackling a different element of writing that will make your um, essay that much better, all right? So don't, don't be worried. You will have an opportunity, of course, to write full-length essays. I'm sure that you are in school as well. All right, but these paragraphs, they really isolate a particular element of storytelling, in this case, narrative writing, and we are focusing on our emotions here, all right? And notice that our students are using a lot of figurative, a lot of descriptive language, things that we have covered previously. So if you look at our creative writing episodes, especially the ones that are aired on a Tuesday, all right, where we review these pieces of work, 
All right, we have seen a marked improvement um, in our students' writing abilities. All right, they have little by little added, as Ms. Nyla teaches, you know, more and more tools, and it's getting really impressive. All right, this is quite good work for students at an SEA age. All right, so I have another submission here now, a lengthier one like Caitlin's. All right, so it's over. I thought excitedly to myself as I left the SEA examination room. A sudden wave of relief swept over my being. All right, my happiness knew no bounds as I was confident I was going to top the island. Wow. All right, so a sudden wave of relief swept over my being. That's very well put. And my happiness knew no bounds as I was confident I was going to top the island, all right? So this is somebody with very high aspirations, all right? You know, they say aim for the stars and you might hit the moon instead, all right? So there's no harm in that. Somebody is going to top the island, of course, or somebody's, all right? Perhaps one of our viewers might. So we love that you have this high aspiration. And you know, once you, once you're, you, you set your target high and you work towards it, even if you fall a little short of such a lofty goal, you know, you will end up somewhere that you are quite pleased with, hopefully. But we don't doubt it, all right? You want to be the top, of course, put in the work, have that dedication, that determination, you know, say your prayers, listen to mommy and daddy, and, you know, put aside all of the idleness just for a few more months, okay? So I knew then that my hard work would not be in vain. After I began to think about my lengthy five-month vacation, it was a gift sent from heaven. Jubilation filled my core as I began to drool. Wow. As I began to drool. And I was lost in wonder thinking about all the fun things I had in store. All right, no doubt. There will be a lot of fun things in store. All of us adults who wrote, you know, uh, well, myself, Common Entrance, and some of you younger adults who wrote SEA and so on, you know about that period after the examination. You know, it's a lot of fun. You get to do a lot of things to de-stress and to just enjoy being a kid again until you embark on that high school journey, all right? So moving along in our essay, all right, um, right, I began to feel like an elated king. Wow, all right. So rubbing my hands together, I began to smirk mischievously. As I left my school's compound, I only imagined myself passing for my first choice and wearing that school's uniform, all right? So this particular writer has it all planned out. They're going to be the top performer on the island, all right? And they're going to be passing for that first choice. Their words, not mine, all right? Just have to wait and time will tell, I muttered to myself, okay? Beaming like the sun's rays as the branches of the old oak tree located near the exit of the school Wave to me and goodbye. And this is by Ishan Gangaram. And I really enjoyed reading that last line, all right? Even though the sentence was a bit long, you know, a bit of a run on sentence that probably could have been, you know, just broken up a little bit. I love that imagery of you leaving your school for the very last time, you know, except when you go to probably, well, actually, you'll be back in school for, for the next term doing different types of activities. But this is the last time that it really, really matters you know you've written that exam and now it's just to wait on those results to do things to be preoccupied in the meantime of course but as ishan is leaving the school looking at that old tree he's imagining or she is imagining i'm not quite sure about the name ishan you know so maybe ishan can message me in a group and let us know all right so we'll use the right pronoun all right um ishan is seeing this trees branches waving goodbye Wow, what, what, a, what an image, all right? So we, we, we like to think that here on see results, some of our young you know, participants, our young students, they, they might very well have a, a career in writing of some sort in the future, right? That's very nicely put. So we have another, yet another submission here now. Okay, so anxiously, as millions of thoughts flew in different directions like a wildfire through my head, my heart raced as fast as a cheetah chasing its prey. All right, so this, this reminds me a bit of um, Kevin Chen and his internet being as fast as a cheetah, right? That one I really liked. My hand shaked, well that sh should really be shook, right? My hand shook like I left it in ice for an hour as time ran short. 
Okay, ding, ding, ding was the sound of the bell signaling the end of exams and the start of me awaiting my SEA results. All right, so the use of that dings there, you know, of course, we talked about um, onomatopoeia and so on. All right, enthusiastically, I shut the door of the examination room. Enthusiastically, as I shut the door of the examination room, I shouted, freedom. All right, my face lit up like diamonds in the sky. My heart rate was going down as a grin appeared on my face, and I felt fresh like roses, all right? So when you're anxious, when you're nervous, yes, your, your pulse might go up. And, you know, it's going down now that you've completed your exam, and um, this writer is feeling fresh like roses, all right? So, wow, I felt like it was time to do my victory dance, all right? So perhaps... Our character in the little image that we provided is doing a victory dance, and every bone in my body wasn't stiff anymore. All right, so parents, you see, you see the kind of stress our students is beyond the right. So please do everything in your power to, you know, comfort them and give them all the support that they need while preparing for this exam. All right, I skipped with excitement, as if I was jumping a skipping rope. It was the best feeling ever, and this work was submitted by Damara Johnson. Damara calls us very regularly on the program. So, you know, congratulations, Damara. Well done. That is very well put. And we hope that all of you who have written to us, you know, with these high expectations of yourself, that you do actualize it. All right? You do put in the work. We know you are working because we see you every weekend submitting all your assignments and your quizzes and your, your creative writing even though you already have so much to do in school, all right? And we are very pleased that you are taking the opportunity, all right, that you are using this medium, which is very new, which is very exciting, all right, to see your work being done on live television. It's being backed up there on Facebook. It's being put up on YouTube. It's going to be there, you know, for as long as the Internet is around, hopefully, all right? So you can always look back on it, perhaps, 10 years down the road when you're completing university maybe, and look at the writing that you did as a child, all right? So, of course, if you've not liked us on Facebook, you can look for C results, you can look for IBN TV, you can also search for the C results YouTube channel and do subscribe to us there, right? Because we upload the episodes. The ones that go to YouTube come a day or two after the live airing, but those on Facebook, as soon as the live has ended, you can find all of all of the videos under the videos tab, all right? So for those of you watching on TV, if you want to rewatch, if maybe you know of a child who missed the program and their work was put up on the program, you can direct them in those avenues, all right? So, all right, I'm gonna read one more here. I felt as if I was on top of the world and a glow of happiness spread through me, all right? As I walked out of the examination room, I felt relieved. Slowly, the pounding eased in my chest and the sweat dried on my brow. I was buzzing with excitement. I couldn't wait for my six-month vacation. I let out a squeal of delight as I punched my fists in the air, as ideas popped up in my head like popcorn. All right? I like that imagery. As ideas popped up in my head like popcorn for my very long vacation, my breathing grew slower and a new calm settled over me as SEA was finally over, and that is by Talia that sign, all right, if I am not mistaken, we have also used Talia's work here on the program before, so Talia continue to write and continue to provide us with these lovely pieces, all right. So I have a few more, but perhaps on Thursday, Miss Nyla might want to read one or two of them to you. All right, I'd, I wanted to give an example here of one that perhaps could have done with a bit more work, all right? So, of course, we don't share the names for these pieces, all right? So, yes, you know, we don't focus too much on the grammar and the spelling for this segment of the program because we could try to cover that in the ELA, all right? And it does influence our writers, you know, we see them applying the rules and so on. But I just want to demonstrate here, you know, how a lack of... Um, proper grammatical rules or application of those rules and spelling can really make your essay look not as appealing, even though this, the ideas contained in this writing, you know, could lead to a much better mark, all right? So let's have a look at this one. 
so who, thank God, SEA finish, all right? So we have some spelling issues there. I said as I walk out of the exam room, all right? That should be in past tense, all right? And we know if, if we are speaking, it needs to be in the quotation marks, all right? Boy, you okay, my best friend Tyler said, you were sweating like you just run a marathon, all right? So we are noticing a lot of spelling errors there. It was hot in there, I replied. Anyway, I have to go now. Bye, Tyler said. I was looking forward to my long holiday. I jump around in excitement where it should be jumped. Notice that we are using the wrong tense here a lot. Um, ideas pop into my mind. I smiled. Okay, so we're using the proper tense now. So much that I got cramp. I was glad that SEA was finished so my head will not be bursting in pain, all right? And we wish you that that pain will go away very soon and that you put in the work, all right? So parents, so please, you know, sit with your child when they're doing these creative writing pieces. If you have the time, you know, try to make the time. And of course, rewatch the videos with them, the ELA and the creative writing, they go hand in hand. They influence each other, they impact each other, right? Proper tenses here, proper spelling, and a bit more descriptive language could really elevate this piece of writing, all right? So, you know, our children, we want them to be functionally um, literate members of society. We want them to be able to read and spell, all right, so that they can communicate effectively and they can um, internalize or take in information effectively as well. It's not just about passing the exam. Remember, all of this has very practical implication in our daily living, all right? So just finally, before we go, we remind you all, of course, about the IBN and San Juan Muslim Ladies Organization essay writing competition. All right, why I love to fast in Ramadan, and it's open to boys and girls 12 and under, and it's due on the Friday, the 10th of April, 2020. That's the Friday after, well, one week after the week of SEA. All right, they must be handwritten and addressed to the IBN Ramadan essay competition here at 61 Bamboo Main Road, Bamboo Settlement, number two, Valsin. And I understand that the organizers have you know, made arrangements to collect at certain schools. If your school is one of those, you will be notified. And there are great cash prizes to be won. All right, 5,000 for first place, 3,000 for second place, and $2,000 for third place. And those prizes are courtesy of the San Juan Muslim Ladies Organization. All right, so do remember to subscribe to us on edmodo.com if your child isn't yet a member. It's not too late, you go to edmodo.com, the code is 6KJQ3Y, the information is there on the um, Sea Results Facebook page as well. So we welcome you to join us, all right? I have been Sir Ijaz Ramsahai, thank you for viewing, and I'll see you all on Thursday for Mathematics and Creative Writing again. Good evening, assalamu alaikum.